first, I want to say thank you to ASCE for having me speak today. It's always a nice opportunity to um, share some knowledge. Um, when I graduated from Penn State, uh, I only got one job offer as a civil engineer, and it was with waste management. And I thought, I cannot believe I'm going to go work at a landfill. I'm in eco action. I pick at places like this. I'm, you know, this is just. Uh, I have no other choice. I'll take this job and I'll work here for two years and then I'll go find something else. Um, so what I pleasantly found was that um, there's a lot of good that you can do for the environment at a landfill and, and they're very highly engineered and um, there's a lot of environmental benefits. So I hope, uh, you know, my talk today, um, I can share some of that with you. Um, so Today, I'm gonna to cover uh, a pretty broad overview. Um, any of these topics you could probably do, you know, a full day seminar on. So I was gonna talk about um, just what makes up a landfill, then um, talk about how they're designed, show how they're constructed, um, the operations and uh, monitoring that goes on with that and uh, the environmental monitoring component, and then what happens after the landfill uh, fills up. So this is a just a, a basic cross section. So um, in Pennsylvania, we have a double liner system. So the bottom liner of the landfill is two layers of 60 mil thick high density polyethylene. So um, if we were in person, I would I would pass around a liner sample so you could see what that is. But there's a, a double liner system. And um, so they're all geosynthetics. They're, they're made out of different kinds of plastics. Um, and so since you have a double liner system, there's a sort of interstitial space so you can monitor for leaks. Um, so that's at the bottom of the landfill. Then you fill in the trash and then you put on a final cover when the whole thing is filled up, uh, you put a final cover. So you're making this sort of like big Ziploc uh, sealed tomb of waste. Um, so the the goal of the final cover is to keep the stormwater out. So um, any liquids that come in with the trash or stormwater that infiltrates the trash collects at the bottom of the landfill, that's called leachate, that gets pumped out and treated. Um, and then of course, uh, trash degrades over time and it creates landfill gas, which is 50% methane. Uh, and about 50% carbon dioxide. So you have this um, energy source and potential explosion hazard. So all that needs to be collected and um, destroyed in some way. So in the old days, it would just be burned in a flare. Um, nowadays, um, uh, most sites have some sort of end use, uh, whether they're generating electricity or doing some sort of direct use where they're firing a boiler. Um, so that's just a, a a quick overview of landfills. Um, so next I wanted to go through some of the design considerations. Um, so the first thing you have to do is figure out where you're gonna put the thing. Um, so subtitle D was passed in 1991, that was underneath RICRA. And so these were the first um, real regulations that set minimum federal standards for landfills. Uh, so up until that point, you had all these little open dumps, like every township had a dump and, you know, there was groundwater contamination. Uh, sometimes there'd be landfill gas migration into people's homes. Um, so these were federal standards that were set that were implemented in 1991. And so what happened from that is that um, in 1988, there were about 7,500 landfills operating across the United States. Today, we're at about 1,500. So, you know, these small little townships couldn't afford to operate and, and um, these little landfills to the current standards because the, the cost to operate these landfills went through the roof. Um, so in addition to these federal standards, um, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, implements subtitle D and then um, supplemented that with their own requirements. So they have requirements for wetlands and 
um, other state permits that you might need. And then you also need to get permitted down to the local level. Um, so uh, you got to meet zoning requirements. Uh, so as part of like trying to figure out where you can put the landfill, you have to do a bunch of studies. Um, so some of these are traffic studies, archaeological, wetlands, soils. Um, so I have a couple slides showing some of these different surveys that we um, run through as we're, as we're doing this work. So um, you have to take a look at what soils are available and how much soil. Um, so landfills are heavily... Uh, dependent on soils. Um, so you need them to construct the bottom liner system and then you need them for daily and intermediate and final cover. Um, so you, you need to find out what kind of soils you have, how much. Uh, many sites tend to be soil poor, so they end up having to import. Um, you have to look at threatened and endangered species. Um, so you know, one of my recent sites, they had the, I think it's the bog turtle. We had to do a, you know, we had to go from the phase one study to the phase two study. So, you know, that could um, restrict where you put the landfill. Um, you have to look at archeological um, impacts if there are any. Uh, there's extensive geologic and hydrogeologic studies um, because, um, you have to look at the underlying hydrogeology, you know, where if you did contaminate the groundwater, where would it go? How quickly does it travel? Uh, and then you have to look at the bearing capacity of the, the, the land itself. And um, you're not allowed to put landfills in karst topography. So if you're, you can't put um, a landfill in that kind of environment because that would, if you leak, have a leak in a karst environment, it could be transmitted um, in very far quickly. Um, this is a wetland study that we did. This was a project where um, um, there was this uh, stream. It was right down the middle of where the landfill was. So we actually went through the Army Corps of Engineers and we, we relocated and made a new stream uh, to the west. Uh, you got to look at where there's rivers. Uh, you got to stay outside of the floodplain. Um, you can't be within a water supply. There's different requirements, whether you're upgrading or downgrading of a water supply. Um, you have to stay away from airports. Um, if, if you remember the uh, miracle on the Hudson, um, you know, that bird, there were birds that brought down that plane. So landfills attract a lot of birds. Um, and so that's a, a big concern. And there's different requirements, whether it's um, a piston uh, type aircraft or jet aircraft. So sometimes we get impacted by just these little like farm airports. We have to stay set back from those. Pennsylvania has requirements for setbacks to homes, schools, parks, playgrounds. Um, you can get waivers for these things, but of course you have to negotiate with the, the homeowner, uh, you know, what they might want in return for that waiver. And then of course, traffic study and access, you know, there's tons of truck traffic that's coming in and out of landfill. So the roads need to support that. Uh, and then as you're laying out your landfill and figuring out where you can put the trash, there's all these ancillary facilities that are sited at a landfill if you've gone to like a citizen's drop-off area. So you, you need to plan for where you're gonna have your maintenance shop because um, there's all this heavy equipment that requires regular maintenance. You have a scale house. Usually there's some sort of area for like composting and then a citizen's drop-off area for recyclables or uh, you know, for people that are just bringing in something from their home, you know, in their pickup truck, we don't want them going up to the working phase. So usually there's a separate location for them to offload their waste. Um, and so while you're doing all this, you're also wanting to think ahead to future expansion. So you don't want to, you don't want to have to, you know, move a maintenance shop. So you want to think long term. Um, as I mentioned, Subtitle D, you know, really limited the number of landfills. They're so much more expensive to site and design, get permitted and operate that um, landfills these days are tend to be very big. There's no more little landfills anymore. 
Um, so you also have your leachate storage and treatment. Um, some sites have on-site treatment. Um, most sites are uh, doing some sort of pre-treatment and discharging. Um, in Pennsylvania, they don't like hauling. So you're only allowed to haul for three years. They don't like the hauling traffic on the road. So uh, that's not typical in Pennsylvania, but it is more typical elsewhere. Um, and then I mentioned the, the landfill gas that gets generated. So that's a whole other part of the um, design is you know, predicting how much landfill gas you're producing, then collecting it all. Um, so this upper right hand uh, picture is a wellhead. So we, we uh, drill wells into the landfill to suck the gas out and then collect it all through a piping network. And then this is a, a flare on the left-hand side here. This is a site where they actually, um, they have an end use project, but you always have to have a backup in case the plant goes down. So then they have a backup for this flare. Uh, this is a, the gas to energy plant at Greater Lebanon Refuse Authority. So you can see, you know, this is not the biggest, you know, it's a, a medium-sized site, but they're generating enough gas to supply over 2,000 homes with electricity. So it's a, it's a, a significant source of fuel. So with all these components, there are all these design elements. Um, so there's, this is the interesting part for me of civil engineering at a landfill is that it, it covers everything. There's uh, geotech engineering, uh, with the settlement analysis, the foundation, the slope stability. Uh, help modeling is the modeling to predict how much leachate could, is going to be produced. So you have to look at the life of the landfill, figure out, make some estimation of how much leachate you're going to produce and then provide storage for that. And then of course, there's all the, the piping and plumbing that, that goes with transmitting all that. Um, and then the landfill gas system is a major component where you have to plan for the piping for that. And landfill gas itself tends to be very moist. So there's, there's liquids management that goes with that. Um, so now I wanna show you some pictures of constructing a bottom liner system. Um, so uh, the first layer is usually some sort of soil layer and depending on what you get permitted, um, you either have to meet a permeability requirement or you don't. Um, so in this, this one, this is a low permeability soil liner and they're usually um, constructed to 10 to the minus seven centimeters per second. So um, as part of that, we do uh, nuclear density testing during construction. And then we'll also take some Shelby tubes um, and send those off to the lab to confirm that we've we got the conductivity that we wanted. Uh, these are rolls of 60 mil liner. So that's the main component of the bottom liner system. And this is all, each of these rolls has um, been individually tested. So we get roll certs for each roll. So it's a pretty big exercise doing CQA during um, bottom liner construction, keeping track of the roles. Uh, we do conformance testing. So usually we do one sample for every 100,000 square feet of liner installed. So you have to keep track of um, how much liner you get, send it to the lab, make sure these lab results match the role certs and the minimum uh, specifications on the project. Um, so this is showing the liner being deployed. This is at Lanchester landfill. Um, so uh, they just pull it off the roll like a you know toilet paper. Um, and so these guys are pulling it down the slope. Uh, so they're they're dragging it down. And then um, when they get uh, get that all in place, then they they weld this thing together. So lost my mouse here. There we go. Uh, so this is just another view of all these panels laid out and they're ready to be welded um, underneath. Uh, usually there's a geotextile. That's probably what you're seeing here is a geotextile um, that's placed to protect that uh, membrane liner uh, from protrusions from rocks. There's specifications on maximum particle size. Um, 
but that geotextile provides an extra cushion and, and lets you go up to say three quarters of an inch maximum particle size. Uh, so this is showing the liner being welded. Um, I have a close up uh, on the next slide. I'll show you. This thing's called, a, they call it a mouse. Uh, so it's, it's heat welding the, the two panels together. So it's like a big quilt project, but you're, you're heat welding it instead of sewing it. Um, and so it's creating, a, it's, it's two lines of heat that are um, fusing the liner together. And so you have an air channel in the middle of that. So what's, what's happening up here is 100% of the seams are tested, air pressure tested to confirm that you have a good seal. Um, there's some areas where you can't do the fusion welding. So it's extrusion welded. That's what's happening in the bottom right. Um, so when you're installing the liner, we have to take destructive samples every 500 feet. So we're actually cutting out a part of the seam and sending that to the lab to confirm we're getting the strength we want on the welds. And then you have to patch those holes. Um, you have to do some patching um, sometimes where there's damage on the liner or where you're tying into an, an existing liner. So uh, what you're seeing here in the upper left hand side, well, the bottom right is where they're actually doing the extrusion welding. And then the upper left is how we test those seams. So we 100% test all the seams. So the vacuum box, you put a soapy solution on the extrusion weld and, and then you put this plate over top of it and you suck you know, air through it. And if you see bubbles uh, bubbling up, then you know you, you, you have a seam that needs to be resealed. Um, so then you'll see all these markings all over the liner as it's installed. Um, so it's, it's highly um, overseen. Uh, usually the liner crew has their own CQC and then the engineering company does CQA. And so you're, you're numbering all the panels, uh, you're numbering all the destruct samples, you're numbering all the repairs and then writing, um, you know, keeping track of the date when all this is done and the time. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that each uh, welder, each person with a unit that you're, they're using to weld does a trial seam twice a day. They do one at the beginning of the day and they do one um, midway through the day. And they do these trial seams and then they do uh, field sampling on that to make sure they're getting the strength requirement that meets the specs. Um, this is showing how we anchor the liner at the edge into the anchor trench, and then that will be backfilled with uh, clay, some, type, some type of soil material. Um, so over top of the bottom liner system, um, we put a protective cover. So in Pennsylvania, that's usually stone. When you get closer to the coast, you'll see sand. Uh, but this is to protect the bottom liner system and also to provide a conduit for the leachate to flow. So um, this is showing, and then once you have the stone, then you put in uh, piping to collect all that leachate. Um, so you give it a, a path to travel. Um, and then this is showing installing side slope risers. So um, we're building a, a big bathtub and there's a low spot, but there's no drain. Um, so we put in these side slope risers, we create this sump at the low point and we put submersible pumps down in to the side slope risers to pump the leachate up and out. Um, back 20 years ago, people were still doing uh, liner penetrations. They would try and they would let it flow by gravity, but you have to penetrate the liner and that's the weakest point and you're at the lowest point. So that's where you're most likely to have a leak. So the new standard and the updated standard is to have install side slope risers. Um, and I mentioned all the paperwork that goes, all the documentation that goes with installing the liner, there's everything surveyed. So we have to prepare a uh, certification report um, that goes to uh, DEP. So it's all the documentation, all the testing that we've done, all our daily logs, and then as built, um, 
that get submitted to the state uh, and they have to approve this project, this cell before trash is allowed to go in it. Uh, so this is just uh, an example of an as-built where we've kept track of all the panels, all the repair locations, all the destruct locations. Um, so there's paperwork that goes with every single one of these numbers. Um, so it's, it's quite extensive. And then for the bottom liner system, there are two of these because there's the secondary liner and the primary liner. Um, just show you some photos of uh, final cover. So once you fill in all the trash, um, the goal is to you know create some sort you know a seal to keep stormwater out, so you stop producing leachate. So you take away that potential contamination source. And these days, it's a huge cost. Um, so that's the hot topic with landfill operators these days is leachate treatment. Um, so the municipalities are and the POTWs are really cutting back on the requirements, you know, of what can be discharged. So it's, it's creating a lot of headaches for everybody. So the goal for everybody is to produce less leachate. Uh, so this is showing um, in a landfill, you have to put soil down at the end of each working day. That's called daily cover. Um, when you get to the outer slopes, you put down a foot of intermediate cover. And then you put, um, so this is showing the intermediate cover. So it's a minimum one foot over top of the trash. So that's ready for a liner. Uh, so then same thing, you, you deploy the liner and you weld everything and, and you create this um, liner quilt over the intermediate cover. Uh, here's another uh, mouse, it's welding the liner together. Um, and I should say that for final cover, uh, usually it's LLDPE, linear low density uh, polyethylene. So uh, I think this label might be incorrect. That's actually probably LLDPE and it's usually 40 mil. So on the bottom liner, we usually have 60 mil for the final cover, it's 40 mil and it's only a single layer. You don't need a double layer for the final cover. Um, this is a geocomposite. Um, I have a, a slide that'll show what this is, but it's a, a synthetic geosynthetic drainage layer. So this is providing a path for the stormwater to flow. Um, so it's a sandwich of two geotextiles with a geonet in the middle of it. And so that's part of the design is uh, there's all sorts of you know, thicknesses on the geonet and on the geotextile. So you have to design the correct um, geocomposite drainage net uh, for the application that you're doing. Um, so they'll be joined together by ties, the geonet, usually the bottom layer is just overlapped, then the geonet's joined by ties, um, and then the geotextile itself is sewn. Um, there's all these penetrations coming through the final cover system, so everything needs to be booted and sealed. Um, landfills are highly regulated for their air emissions, and so they have to do surface emissions monitoring on a quarterly basis, and uh, the detection limit is very low, and you have to monitor all the penetrations. You can't just like avoid those. You have to monitor on a grid, and then you have to hit all your penetrations. So the whole thing really needs to be sealed up tight. So this is showing the final, uh, the geosynthetics placed over top of the intermediate cover, and now it's ready for uh, the final cover soils. So this is usually a two foot thick layer, and usually what you put down is uh, 18 inches of a soil and then six inches of topsoil so that you can get grass to grow. So this is showing a uh, completed uh, final cover. Uh, this is modern landfill in, in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a, a picture, a nice picture of Fry Farm landfill. Uh, this is Lancaster County, um, you know, what it looks like from the air. And then maybe after this presentation, you'll be like me. And when you're flying in an airplane, you'll, you'll be able to pick out all the landfills as you're, as you're going along. This is showing installing the landfill gas extraction wells. So normally it's drilled down uh, three foot two or three foot borehole, and then a uh, slotted pipe is put in there, backfilled with uh, stone. Um, and then that's connected to, uh, this is showing a wellhead. Um, so 
this this one is the 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 pipe for the gas to come up there's a, a valve here and there's monitoring ports um, and then the gas uh, is collected it's all joined together collected and sent to some sort of destruction uh, but so the whole thing is connected to some sort of blower system that's pulling on the gas um, and so you have to do pretty extensive monitoring because you don't want to pull too hard on the gas extraction system. Uh, you need to be able to dial back individual wellheads. If you pull too hard, you pull oxygen in to this uh, mass that's getting warm as it's degrading and you have uh, you know, methane. So if you pull too hard, you can create a subsurface oxidation event. And then a massive part of landfill design is stormwater management. So you got to get all the stormwater off of the landfill and then um, manage it in, in ponds. Um, so the stormwater calculations and design is, is always a massive effort at the landfill. And then in addition to that, you know, there's grading for roads. Um, so it's, like I said, every aspect of civil engineering you could imagine. Um, so switching over to operations and maintenance, there's all these, uh, this other, you know, once you get past all the engineering part, there's just running the landfill, the day-to-day -day management of it. Um, so in Pennsylvania, they will set a maximum daily tonnage you can take. There are requirements for screening the waste as it's coming in. Um, so anything from a household can just go in the landfill, but something from a factory or false craft or, you know, different factories, their off spec filters or, you know, whatever they produce, contaminated soils, all those things are considered special waste in Pennsylvania and you have to be approved to take them. Um, there's waste compaction. So when you're operating at the, the working face, you know, you're trying to get as much trash into this space as possible because the more you get in there, the more money you make and the longer it takes until you need to go put a landfill somewhere else. Um, so I mentioned daily and intermediate cover you, and then you need to stockpile that. So that's also part of your site planning. It's amazing how quickly you can run out of space at a landfill when you're trying to find places that, to store all these materials that you need. Um, safety is a big uh, aspect of landfills. Um, and then there's all sorts of inspection requirements by the state, record keeping, and then leachate and landfill gas management is a massive effort. Um, so just following, uh, you know, what happens is, uh, so these are scale houses. So each load comes in and it's, it's weighed in and weighed out. Um, and then if it's some sort of special waste, the scale house operator has to um, you know, make sure they're approved to come in and potentially notify the, the guys at the working face, you know, if it's some sort of um, like uh, asbestos, you know, if they have to dig a hole, uh, so they'll notify the working face, um, you know, if there's something unusual coming up. So this is a, a landfill working face, um, so it's showing the waste being unloaded and then um, they'll use uh, they'll spread it out um, and then they'll start compacting it. Um, so the, the rule of thumb is to do at least three passes to get the most compaction you can on the trash. And then at the end of each day, they need to place daily cover. So uh, that's at least six inches of soil, but many sites have gotten approval for alternate daily covers. So they'll use like contaminated soils or tarps or foam. Uh, foundry sand has been approved for alternate daily cover. That way you're not filling up your landfill with clean soil. So uh, you're main, you know, extending the life of this resource. I mentioned birds. Birds are a big problem at landfills um, and there's different ways to control them. Um, some sites will have um, little like flares that uh, go off every you know, hour or something. Some sites get approval to um, they have to get a permit where they can kill a bird and then hang it so it scares off the other birds. There's different methods for bird control. Um, odor control is a big issue. Um, so this is uh, uh, a misting system, pretty extensive. Most sites I see don't, don't have such an extensive system 
But the main thing to control odors at the landfill is to have good cover, install your final cover as soon as you can, uh, and then operate your gas system. This is showing litter fencing. So litter control is a big issue. Uh, so we have litter fencing. Pennsylvania doesn't allow, you have to be you know, on top of your litter. You can't just leave litter blowing off the site. So they, you can get a notice of violation for too much litter. Um, and then jumping over to environmental monitoring, this, these are all things that, that came out of subtitle D. Um, so you have to do groundwater monitoring at least quarterly, and you have to do statistical analysis. There's requirements uh, to have wells up gradient and down gradient. You need to show that you're not impacting the groundwater. And if you are, then you have to go into uh, extra monitoring and then potentially put in some sort of groundwater treatment system. Um, although I have to say, all the subtitle D sites, I don't know any of them that have leaked. Um, so most of the groundwater remediation work that we do, or all of it, um, is for old online sites. Uh, there's surface water monitoring requirements, uh, leachate, you have to monitor how much you're producing, you have to do uh, quarterly testing on that. You have to test that witness zone between the primary and secondary liner. If you collect liquid there, uh, and if you go over a certain threshold, you have to test it and see if it's leachate. Um, sometimes there's a chance stormwater is somehow getting in uh, to that um, interstitial space. Um, and then there's monitoring for landfill gas. So there are perimeter probes around the outside of the landfill to monitor for gas migration. But again, I haven't seen that at any of the subtitle D sites where we see that is usually the online landfills. Um, so this is just showing um, the, the placement of groundwater wells. Uh, so your up gradient well will be your background well, and then you'll have your down gradient wells. And um, you have to monitor uh, or figure out whether you have you know, different aquifers, um, you know, whether you're monitoring the shallow aquifer or deep or both, and um, how you install that groundwater monitoring system to make sure you're properly monitoring the landfill. Uh, this is showing taking groundwater samples, so that's um, quite an effort. Uh, this is a stormwater sample. Uh, these are, this is a perimeter probe um, monitoring. So they're doing the perimeter probes and they're doing the gas extraction wells that are in the landfill, um, those landfill gas technicians. And then once the landfill is closed, um, you, you, you get the whole final cover system installed. You can't just walk away at that point. So subtitle D requires at least 30 years. So when you're permitting your landfill, you have to make estimates of what it's going to cost to maintain the landfill for 30 years after, you know, for this post-closure care period. And you have to um, post some sort of financial mechanism so that uh, the state doesn't get into a situation kind of like Superfund. So uh, the idea is um, you post this financial mechanism, and if somebody goes bankrupt, the state has the money to be able to then operate the landfill or maintain it for the next 30 years. So, you know, trash settles uh, over time. So sometimes you have to, you end up with depressions that need to be filled in, you know, because that affects the stormwater runoff. Um, so you have to continue, continue doing all your gas um, monitoring and maintenance of your gas extraction system. Um, you're doing all your groundwater monitoring, you still have leachate, leachate is still being generated. So, um, you know, you're still doing that for 30 years after um, the landfill closes. Um, and then there are end uses. So this is a, a ball field that's on top of an old landfill. Um, so that's the, you know, how can you keep generating income, you know, from this property after it closes. So some sites put on um, cell phone towers. Uh, this is Lanchester landfill. Um, they're not generating income, but they're a resource to the community. And they they're, they might be the highest point in the county. Uh, so they have a picnic area. 
and they're open on Sundays and there's a walking path and a playground. Um, I know last year they were talking about putting in like a 70 foot long slide. I don't know if that actually got uh, completed um, but they have a lot of people that, that come, you know, for the view. And uh, so, uh, and this is in Amish country. So I think some of the folks actually show up in a horse and buggy 